expected you to, to return with the band? Like, the, the shocking return of the Misfits. <laughs> what motivated you that you thought, okay, let's well, go back? Well, uh, when Glenn left the band and uh, we were in the process of, we have a machine shop where we build our guitars and we build our drums, and we were in the process of moving it from one facility to a new building that we had built. And uh, the machinery is very large. It's the size, some of them is the size of a bus. So it takes many, many days to move one piece of machinery, and we had hundreds of them to move. So it took us about a year to settle in. And uh, we never really wanted to abandon the band for 13 years like we had to. Uh, what happened was Glenn had signed a contract with Caroline Records to release all the old Misfit stuff. And the name Misfit was then legally being used, which kept it from our use. We weren't able to use it. Who created of, that? Uh, Glenn and I. Glenn and you. Yeah. About the beginning, very beginning, you started up in summer of '77. Yeah. How? Wh what's it, was the main difference you think about the the the, U the punk from UK, this kind of bands, Sex Pistols and Damadan, and the American bands? Because they are very different. And some people say that the New York scene he started punk movement and then. Well, Malcolm the McLaren saw really Richard Hell and took to well, well, right, and well, then to well, even before Richard Hell, Iggy Pop was was like the godfather of punk. I would consider Iggy Pop was uh, very. Uh, robust the way he would do things and he was very rude in a lot of ways with his lyrics and the way he would perform and his attitude was that of the the punk attitude he had a very punk attitude he still does to, to, this, to this day and uh, what happened was a lot of that went over to England uh, the problem was I think that Malcolm McLaren really made a commercial entity out of the Sex Pistols and I really if you look at the Sex Pistols they have one good album and that's all so that's all. I mean so big deal it just seems to me that it was uh, all hype and it was a lot of, a lot of uh, promotion and uh, propaganda and uh, the problem was that the music was very strong in the United States the punk movement was not a social movement we didn't have poor kids with no jobs who wanted to rebel like they had there, yeah like they had there okay so for them it was a very strong statement to be a punk and say hey you know I don't care about my life I want to destroy everything because I have no future and my life sucks and what happens is in the United States the kids were not caring about that we were not being being destructive we were being creative we were looking at the music and saying this is great music let's see where we can go with it so then you had bands like the Ramones you had bands like um, at the time Blondie when Blondie first came out was kind of punk well, on a commercial side you had uh, the Dead Boys which was very good Steve Bader yeah okay then uh, then then you got into the uh, into the skinhead movement bands like Black Flag Minor Threat and uh, you also had that angle too where it was very uh, macho uh, male oriented kind of uh, a rumble. I mean, really what it was, I, a lot of the shows were crazy all the time. And then you had bands like us. Uh, we came along and uh, the, the only difference between us and everybody is that on every level, we excelled. We had a very good visual presence. We had a very good musical presence. Uh, as you can see, we're very physically trained to go out and perform a show that's very physical. I mean, we don't drink and we don't smoke and do these kind of things because it takes away from our performance. And that's right. That you disbanded like in '83. Yeah. Two. You, you had you had one band that I know, Christ the Conqueror. Yes. But what did you do? Because well, uh, Christ the Conqueror was a byproduct of our engineering of new equipment in the 80s and the and the late 70s we would buy used equipment and we would take it home and we would cut it with saws and make it look like misfit guitars and you crafted that yes by ourselves yeah well the, the original not. ones were used equipment that we would buy used and then you know transform it into a guitar that looked like it would be be ours and when the band broke up we were in the machine shop and we, th we start there and we thought to ourselves should we continue to buy used equipment or should we begin to develop our own because everything that we had we were destroying it wasn't holding up it wasn't taking the punishment so it took us about five years to develop the new style of guitars and now we use all synthetic materials we use graphite um, we use uh, we have no control knobs on our guitars and things like this so uh, they're pretty much indestructible and it took us many years to develop this so that was about five year process there and then uh, Chud's drum kit unfortunately due to uh, the cost of bringing our 
equipment over, we weren't able to bring our drum kit to South America. But uh, the drum kit was built out of about four or five different drum kits. And we used the bass drums to make floor toms. And we used the floor toms to make rack toms. So our kit is one size larger than everybody else's. And then we machine these giant metal spikes that go on them. So this thing is huge and it, it, it's, it's, it's very big. And it looks almost like a stegosaurus, like a prehistoric animal. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so what happened was that took us about another two or three years to perfect that and get that ready to go. So when you come to see the Misfits, uh, you're dealing with people who are very well rounded as far as developing their own sound. Our sound is totally original based upon the fact that we make our own equipment. So not only do we write our own material and perform our own material, but the equipment that we play is all handcrafted. So there's nobody really out there that is doing what we do. And uh, you know, it took us many years to develop this. I think that if we did didn't have all those years to think about it we probably right. we, we probably wouldn't have done it but uh, based upon having all the time and nothing to do with it uh, we did this uh, that's also where Christ the Conqueror came in when we were developing guitars we were playing a lot of riffs we would build a guitar and say oh let's hear how it sounds so we weren't writing songs we were writing riffs guitar riffs so that was based upon a heavy metal kind of a feel where you would write the music and then add the lyrics later where the misfits is the reverse you come up with a very strong vocal melody and then you figure out what chords they are and you work it that way so uh, it was a good clinic for us it was a good learning uh, program and it also it enables us now to repair our equipment on the road if something breaks nine out of ten times we can fix it ourselves without having to go and, and, and find someone to fix it so Composer, wasn't he? Ah, uh, yeah, he was in the beginning. Uh, well, he would come down with very strong ideas. He would come down with uh, the melody lines, and then the music. We would put the music together and arrange the songs and uh, add beginning and endings to songs and breaks in the middle. And uh, so musically, we would compose with him. Uh, lyrically, he wrote most of the lyrics and uh, would do most of the vocal melodies. So uh, I would say probably 75% uh, was Glenn and 25% on the music side was, was the rest of us putting it together. But uh, I feel that in the future, as he pr uh, proceeded with other bands like Sam Hain and Danzig, I felt that it was just a short cry for, compared to what he was doing when he was with us. I think that uh, he missed the boat. <laughs> missed the boat, that's it. I interviewed him and he's not the kind of easygoing person. He was very, yeah, all right, very, very quiet yeah. and very, he looked like kind of dark personality and... Yeah, well, you know, he takes himself very seriously and I think that's one of his main problems. It takes to de develop this kind of image because he's a trademark of the band and well, really yeah. calls atten attention. By the first time that I, I picked like a Misfits album, I said, wow, I want to listen to that. Yeah. How long does it take to? Well, well what happened? Well, what happened was that uh, in the beginning we were very influenced by the British punk invasion, uh, the Sex Pistols, the Clash, uh, things like this, and Damned. Yeah, the, awesome. the Damned. And uh, what happened was that in England they were using very colorful. Uh, hair colors. So I had my hair f fluorescent blue and Doyle, his hair was pink. Uh, actually in eighth grade they wouldn't let him graduate, uh, get his diploma because he had pink hair so my mother had to walk up there and uh, cause a problem with the principal and get his diploma. And um, so we were kind of extreme on that side. And as time progressed we drifted away from your typical punk kind of an attitude and developed our own image. And what happened was as I used to have spiky hair, and as it started to grow, I began to comb it to the front, kind of like Elvis with a little flip in the front. And as it got longer, we decided that we didn't want to have colored hair, we wanted everything to be black and very dark and sinister. So, like number one. Yeah, yeah. so, so uh, we decided to dye our hair black, and once we dyed our hair black, we looked in the mirror and we said, wow, look at this, That's here, it. here we go. So it kind of found us, uh, and uh, I think that it's one of the real trademarks of the band. Uh, it's good to go out to a crowd, a, a sea of kids, and look down and see a lot of them with your makeup and your hair and